Though we proclaim our faith, we often fail to act as God requires. Daily we indict ourselves as we turn away from acts of justice and mercy. But God promises to forgive us when we repent of our weakness and our shame. Let us confess our sins. Let us pray. Forgive us, Lord for all the times we forget who we are in you. We live and think in limited ways, believing that this world is our only home. We do not remember how Jesus stood without fear before Pilate and claimed that his kingdom did not belong to this world. We confess that we don't treat each other in ways that help to reveal your kingdom. We confess our weakness and our lack of understanding. We confess that we get so caught up in the smallness of our own little world that we forget to look towards your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to look beyond this world to see the kingdom that lies ahead. Oh, Lord, hear our silent confession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus did not send God. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is good news, not only to us, but to all people in every age. We are forgiven. Praise be to Christ. Now let us hear a reading from the prophet Samuel. From 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. Now these are the last words of David the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, Ruling in the fear of God is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. 
will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are eternally, entirely consumed in fire on the spot. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for today comes to us from the gospel according to John. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Here end our reading. May God bless understanding to our hearts. Pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Of the four gospels, John provides the most detailed account of the encounter between Jesus and Pontius Pilate the Roman governor of Judea. His callousness was legendary, and he himself was eventually recalled to Rome and stood trial for cruelty and oppression. If you could choose your judge, you would not want 
Pontius Pilate. But Jesus cannot choose. As John describes it, he is caught between a rock and a hard place. Complex power dynamics existed between the Judean religious leaders and this Roman governor who had the power to pronounce the death sentence. Passover, the annual celebration of Israel's liberation from slavery, God's victory over Pharaoh, was always politically explosive. You never knew when some hothead would stir up riots against the hated Romans. Pilate's job was to make sure that did not happen. He always brought in extra military power to handle the large crowds of Passover pilgrims coming to the temple. The presence of Roman legions along with his own no-nonsense reputation had generally done the job. Scholars believe this gospel was written in the early years of the second century. It was written during a time when emerging Christianity and emerging Pharisaism were rival versions of Judaism, one of which believed that God's Messiah had come in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the other of which doubted that God's Messiah would die on a cross and did not see any signs of the messianic age, messianic age present since the coming of Jesus. So they disagreed sometimes bitterly about these matters, a theological disagreement that colored the way the historical events were remembered. What we have in John's passion narrative is a complex entanglement of theological and political reflection, written in the context of a highly charged argument between a local Christian community and the synagogue down the street. John's gospel exposes both the hypocrisy of the religious leaders preparing to celebrate the Passover according to the law of Moses and the hypocrisy of Pontius Pilate, who in theory at least stands for the grandeur of Roman law in which criminal justice is not to be perverted by mob rule. So to do this, the evangelist John constructs a seven scene play in John 18 verses 28 through 19, 16. It all happens at the Praetorium, Pilate's headquarters, which includes the governor's residence, military barracks, and an outdoor courtyard used as a court of judgment. There, at least as John tells it, two worlds collide. Outside are Judean religious leaders who want Jesus killed, but who lack the power to do it themselves under Roman rule. Inside is Pilate's prisoner, brought early that morning from Caiaphas. Outside, the religious leaders and crowd shout their demands up to Pilate. Inside, Pilate and Jesus engage in rational, even philosophical discourse. John shows Pilate's indecision by having him move back and forth between the two worlds, outside and inside, outside and inside. At the end of the seven scenes, the Judean religious leaders who do not enter the praetorium so as not to defile themselves ritually, end up saying, we have no king but Caesar. And by saying this, they have an effect of piled themselves anyway. And Pilate, who at the beginning insisted that serious charges be brought and proved, caves to pressure to kill a man of whom he himself has said three times, I find no case against him. So Roman justice is exposed for the farce that it is. This week's passage occurs in the second scene inside the Praetorium. The first conversation between Pilate and Jesus does not go well. Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers Pilate's question with a question. Where did he get his information? Pilate implies that others have told him about Jesus. 
Why should he care? He's not Jewish. He asks, so what have you done? Jesus again does not answer Pilate's question, instead stating twice that his kingdom is not from this world. If it were, his followers would be fighting for him. Pilate, who only knows of one world, can hardly appreciate Jesus's argument, but he grabs hold of what he can understand. So you are a king. Once again, Jesus and Pilate are talking past each other. Jesus responds, you say that I am a king. The implication, what I say about myself is, for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate then asks the crucial question. What is truth? On the one hand, we think we know the rest of the story. But like that great movie, The Never Ending Story, the story of Jesus's kingship and the nature of truth are still ongoing stories of which we are all a part. So where are you in this story? Where are you in truth? Are you a Roman in the shadows behind Pilate, willing to support him no matter what? Will you go along with him, even though you find no evidence to convict? Or are you with the mob outside shouting to crucify? Are you a confused and horrified disciple? Are you running away in fear? Or are you back at work or at home simply ignoring the ruckus? If we roll the camera forward to millennia, we are all living in an age when the nature of truth is on trial and we must decide whose authority or kingship we trust. In some respects, we are all in the midst of the shouting crowd in the story. Our lives are bombarded with voices and information. There is shouting everywhere around us. I cannot turn on my computer or my phone or the TV without some quote unquote expert telling me over and over again how I should understand some hot button issue and who I should believe. Who should I trust? And we're all talking past each other all the time without truly listening. What I would encourage is that you trust in God, Jesus, and yourself. Loving God and loving your neighbor should guide all your actions and your understanding. The only real truth is love you will probably get tired of hearing me say that over the next months ahead. And trusting in your direct experience is valid and important. And if your heart is in the right place, your direct experience will lead you to God and to Jesus. Trust your direct experience. Many decades ago, when I was first in graduate school and studying psychology, a professor talked about the power of our direct experience in understanding human behavior and emotions. He encouraged us to never take the picture to be the reality. What does that mean? As an example, all my life, I have seen pictures of the devastation caused by tornadoes, and I have heard people talk about how the approaching cyclone sounds like a freight train roaring toward you. But in 2014, when I was in Nebraska, I saw the funnel cloud and dashed to the storm cellar with my granddaughter and grandson 
we huddled together and heard the freight train sound and then emerged to see firsthand the devastation of the storm. After two decades in Nebraska, I know firsthand about tornadoes. I also know about COVID firsthand, not because of the media and the pictures you see, but because I endured and survived it before the vaccine. So this principle holds true in our faith life too. I don't know about the love of God or the power of loving my neighbor because I saw it in a movie or on the internet, or read it in a book, or even because I read it in the Bible. I know about it because of the reality of it at work in my life. I've been privileged in my journey to have walked with many of the least of these. I have sat with the suffering at the moment of death. I've been there at the moment of birth. I have held the bereaved. I have given food to the poor. I have welcomed strangers. In reaching out in love, I have met Jesus and therefore have been touched by and known God. So my friends, in this day and age in which we so often talk past each other, and every kind of expert is telling you what to believe and what is truth. I encourage you to let your life be guided by the one true king, the king of heaven and earth. Give your allegiance to God and live by Jesus's commandment to love your neighbor and your life will be blessed and you will have no doubt about what is truth, because Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. Amen. Now, thank we all our God. Sorry. Oh,
Are there joys and concerns you'd like to be lifted up in prayer today? I would like prayers for Drew Taylor and his wife, Allison Unroe, and also for his uncle, Jerry Robinson. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. Can you hear me? We can't hear you. I think I think they can hear you, Liz. Go ahead, unmute. Could we pray for travelers over this holiday? Um, not only my nephew, but all that are, you know, trying to fly, that everyone remains civilized and that, that everybody get here safely. Thank you. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, Friday night, uh, one of our neighbor's houses uh, caught fire, and I'm not sure exactly how much damage there was, but uh, I know they're not in the house right now. Um, so, I, and I don't even know their names, but they live a couple houses up. So, um, I'd like to keep them in our prayers. We've also had uh, several deaths at uh, Volvo, uh, a couple of them were COVID related, and uh, I'd like to keep those families in our prayers as well. Anybody else? You all pray with me. O most holy and gracious God, ruler of heaven and earth, hear our prayers. We are awed by all that you are, God, so much more than we can begin to imagine. We give you thanks, God, for all of creation. We thank you that you love us and provide for us. We thank you, God, for the gift of home and family. We thank you for the opportunities you give us to serve. We thank you for work and for times of rest and relaxation. We thank you, God, for all our many freedoms, for this blessing of the nation we call home. We pray, God, for all who are traveling this week to be with family and friends in celebration. May they arrive safely at their destination. We pray, God, for all who are struggling with COVID, that you will see them through this storm and return them to health. We pray for all those who are ill, God, that you bring them healing. We pray for those struggling with addictions, they will find their strength in you. We ask God that you be with those who struggle with mental illness.
Be with those who need comforting, those who grieve. Be with the Janet's neighbor as they recover from the fire. Bring them the help they need to rebuild their home. We pray God for all those who are homeless. We pray that you will find a place for them out of the cold. We pray for the refugees, especially those relocating in this community. We pray, God, that you will help us to listen to each other better, and that you will help us to listen to you. There are so many voices shouting at us. Open our hearts that your voice will be the loudest one we hear. Help us to live in the power of your love always. God, hear the silent petitions of our heart. O oh Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ashley? Morning. You've already seen me once today, but this time I'm coming up here to talk a little bit about stewardship. Um, and I didn't prepare anything, so if I start rambling, you know, somebody make a discreet sort of uh, face at me or something. Um, so in the big Methodist church that I grew up in, that I loved, um, Stewardship Month was kind of like Pledge Week on NPR, right? Like it came around and everybody kind of groaned and rolled their eyes and you kind of knew it was necessary, but you hated it because you were going to be reminded over and over again, it's time to make your pledge, it's time to make your pledge. And, you know, there might be one of those big thermometers outside the church if we were doing a, a you know, a construction project or something. And so... Um, uh, Martha talked about the liturgical year. I feel like as a child, I had this sense that like the liturgical year was the most important, the most important part of liturgical year was stewardship month, because it seemed like it just dragged on forever. And it was such a big deal. It is, of course, not part of the liturgical year at all. Um, but it is necessary to uh, stewardship is necessary to the ongoing life of our community. Um, when I started attending Glade in 2016, it was because I was explicitly looking for a church that cared about stewarding something besides itself, um, that cared not just about membership numbers or pledge numbers, but had uh, was at work in the community and was involved with social justice. I specifically was looking for that kind of church. And people said to me, you should go to Glade. Glade cares about social justice and they're a small church, but they do all kinds of good work in the community. And I thought that sounds like me, even though Glade in many ways is the complete opposite of the giant church I grew up in. Um, I thought that's, what, that's where I wanna be. I wanna be at a church that 
um, that cares about the community and that sees its mission, not just as its own self-perpetuation, but as serving the people in the community around it. And I have found that to be the case with Glade. I mean, even during announcements, right? The diaper drive, the canned food drive, laundry love. Um, for a small church, we do an immense amount of good in the community. Um, and so for me, stewardship is about helping Glade have the resources to continue doing that kind of work. Yes, it's about taking care of the building. Yes, it's about paying the minister and paying Nancy. Yes, it's about all of those important things, you know, keeping the, the, the oil tank full. Um, but the purpose of that is so that Glade can keep doing good work in the world, right? Um, when I think about stewardship, about my gifts to the church, I think in terms of my time, um, my volunteer opportunities, and also, of course, in terms of, um, in terms of financial resources, because we know that we can't continue to do the kind of work in the community that we need to do without the financial resources that keep us going. So for me, stewardship, unlike my sense of the church that I grew up in, uh, my sense here is that stewardship is very much about enabling us to do the kind of work that we want to continue to do in the world. And so stewardship month, instead of being, you know, something that I roll my eyes and groan at and say, oh, it's time for stewardship month again. Um, it gives me an opportunity to think about how I can continue to support Glade as we steward not only our community, but, you know, our small community of the church, but the community around us as well. Thanks. Just as an update. Um, as of right now, we're only at about 40% of our budget as far as our pledges go. So uh, as we finish going through the month, uh, we'll need to keep that in mind so we can uh, make the budget and make plans for next year and, and where we want to go. All right. my friends, go forth and enjoy every moment in God's good creation. Treasure time, savor every opportunity to serve in Christ's name. Treasure others, follow every movement of the Spirit's leading. Treasure the truth found only in the life and kingdom of Jesus Christ. And may God our Creator bless you and keep you. May God our Savior be your guide and your strength. And may God, the Holy Spirit, watch over you and fill you with love and peace, now and forevermore. Amen.
Bye.